Jesus is the way, but what is the destination? Because he said, I am the way and the truth and the life. He did not say, no one goes to heaven except through me. He said, no one comes to the Father except through me. John 14, and I want to talk about Father God today because probably nothing in my life gives me joy like like being a dad. I, as many of you know, I have eight children, and one of the reasons I have eight children, it is primarily because I love my wife. It is also because there is no joy in my life like the joy of being a dad. I remember early with my very first child, Samara, and my wife and I, we would go out and we would do dates to a Japanese steakhouse that no longer exists. And we would go to this, and I remember taking my little child, and if any of you that are fathers, you remember what it was like to, to just try to get your child to stop crying. You know, like there's nothing quite like a child that just continues to cry. And so I would just put juice in a bottle, and when she would drink the juice, she would stop. She would stop crying, but then she'd start crying again, so I would give her more juice, you know. And so one time we were driving, and she drank two bottles of this juice as we're on our way to the steakhouse and we get to the steakhouse and I'm carrying my daughter and and we walk in and there's a crowded you know how it is you're sitting around a hibachi table and they heat the thing up and I love a hibachi table right and so we're we're going there and just as we go it's me holding my daughter actually it might have been Ruthie holding our daughter and I'm walking in and the lady says as we go to sit down at a crowded hibachi she says enjoy your dinner is what she says and just as she says enjoy your dinner Samara had already looked like a walking volcano or a being held volcano. And, and just as she says, enjoy your dinner, the contents of that ride from our house to, to that place unload onto the hibachi, which is heated up, and it sizzles all the way down. And the people at the table next to us say, enjoy your dinner. Ruthie says, take your daughter. I'm going to go to the bathroom to get something to clean this up. And she disappears for about 20 minutes. And I'm holding this little child that I don't know quite know what to do with. And she had the biggest smile and she was as happy as could be. But there's nothing like being a dad and looking in the eyes of a child that no matter what they've done, you just adore them. And today I'm praying that the love of the Father is going to be revealed. So John 14 is where I'm going to start in verse 1. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions or many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going, and how can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known the Father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip now chimes in and says, Lord, show us the Father and it's sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and yet you haven't known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I speak to you, I don't speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Most assuredly I say to you, He who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these will he do, because I'm going to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Let's pray. God, help. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and have a seat. I find this astounding that Jesus is 
just about to be crucified and be in the worst agony that a human can be, and his opening words are, don't let your hearts be troubled. Jesus is going to be troubled like no one's ever been troubled as he's going to go into the Garden of Gethsemane where he is going to sweat drops of blood as he is in the anguish of looking at the coming wrath that's going to be poured out upon him, not just by a Roman government, not just by the high priest, not just by the religious institution, but the sins of all of humanity from from the east to the west and the north to the south is going to be laid on him. He knows what it is to be troubled, and yet, even in his worst hour, his mind is not on himself. It's on his disciples and his people. Don't let your hearts be troubled, he says. I am the way, and I am the truth, and I am the life, he says. Now, there are really two issues that are in play here, and one of them is the the way. When we read this, it's this classic passage of the exclusivity of Jesus Christ, of of the uniqueness of Jesus in, in the marketplace of religions where all the prophets of all the time and all the teachers have, have given their two cents and yet Jesus comes with a trump card that says, I am the way. There's a message and a word of exclusivity of the uniqueness of Jesus for the salvation and for the way. And when it comes to the way, I think Christians have done a very effective job of identifying the way. What is the way? Who is the way? Say his name. Jesus. He says, I am the way and the truth and the life. Jesus is the way. The scripture says, there is no other name under heaven by which men and women can be saved. That's what it says. There is no other name under heaven other than the name of Jesus. I mean, do you need something today? The name of Jesus has the power. If a demon pops up, there's one name you want to use. Use the name of Jesus. You want to pray for the sick? Use. He says, if you ask for anything in my name, I will do it. The scripture says, every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess. Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Can someone say amen? So when it comes to the way, I think Christians have this very well established. But I'm not so sure we have the destination. The way is Jesus. But what's the destination? When I became a Christian, I'm telling you, I heard this a hundred times. Jesus is the only way to heaven. The only way to the streets of gold is Jesus. The only way to the mansions is Jesus. The only way to rewards is Jesus. Jesus is the way. But what is the destination? Because he said, I am the way and the truth and the life. He did not say, no one goes to heaven except through me. He said, no one comes to the Father except through me. You could say, does it really matter? No, I think it actually matters a great deal because Jesus is the way, but the destination is not just a place. The destination is a person, and his name is the Father. Jesus is showing us the way to a person. The burden of my message today is I think a lot of us have grabbed hold of the way, but we never get to the destination. And Jesus says, when you come to me, I'm going to bring you to the Father. When he says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. How does he give you rest? He takes you to the house of the Father. He's not sticking you in a, in, a, in a hostel. He's not putting you in a hospital. He's not putting you in a hotel. He's not giving you an Airbnb. He's bringing you to the home of the Father. My burden today is that many of us are living like orphans where we look to church to be an institution where we get weakened visitation rights from the master when we discover from Jesus he's not trying to get orphans in an institution called an orphanage. He's trying to get children, sons and daughters that have full-time custody from their father who gives them constant habitation from now until eternity come. Amen. 
A lot of us are, are like, even our churches have become like these orphanages where we come to God and we, and we beg him. We're like, oh, Lord Jesus, please, Lord Jesus, please, could you just, could you just, Lord, please, just, oh, Lord, please, oh, please, Jesus, could you please, could you please just give me a little crumb? And listen, I get it because when you've been an orphan and you're used to living in an orphanage or you're used to living on the streets, it's hard to just walk into the presence of your father. But man, listen, I, like around here, I'm kind of like the boss at the church or whatever, and yet I was in a meeting recently and my kids just barged right in. And the person I was with was like, who do they think they are? And the answer is, that's my child. And, and I get I try to be professional. I try to do all those things. But do you guys understand that children have access that other people don't have access to? And today I want to tell you, this is not an orphanage. This is supposed to be an extension of Father's house. As some prophets of old used to say, come and go with me to my Father's house. It's a, it's a big, big house with lots and lots of rooms. It's got a big, big table with lots and lots of food. A big, big yard where we can play pickleball or whatever it is that you play. See, see my burden here is that many of us are living, and in, in even today, you've got, like I'll hear people say, man, I, I got to get to church to get my, my little injection. I'm like, I've got something better for you than this. Imagine a world that you live in. Imagine a life where you don't say goodbye to God when you say amen, and you don't say peace out until I come back, until I get to my micro church into a little prayer meeting. Do you understand that God's dream for you is that he would have full-time custody, that he would have constant habitation with you, and that when we come to worship. This is, we're not trying to get warmed up for worship. We've been worshiping all week. That's the vision is that we were the God that says, I'm never going to leave you. And that's not bad news to us because I'm not living just with my judge. He is my judge, but he's also my dad. When I was a freshman at the University of Florida, Jesus rescued me. And I did not really know a lot about doctrine. Like, I, I, I didn't. Like, I fell in love with Jesus, and I started reading my Bible, and I read, started reading the book of Matthew, and I was like, this is the greatest thing I've ever read. Like, why has no one ever told me about, I mean, one of the ways, by the way, you know that you're actually saved is when you read the, like, when you get hungry for the Bible. Like, like this craving for spiritual milk and meat is like one of the signs that you belong. If the Bible never does, ever does it for you, it's probably a bad sign. Either you're not alive or you're sick. Because I was like, wait, what, what, the, what the heaven is this? Like, where did this come from? I was loving this. I was like, and I was getting, but I was, I was starting to experience, and I was starting to encounter. I was beginning to, to, let me just say it. I was experiencing what it says in the Psalms when it says, in the presence of the Lord, there is fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore. I was starting to, like, oh, wait a minute, I know what pleasures are. I've been with girls, I've been to parties, I've done stuff, and then I had Jesus, and I'm like, there are things that are happening in this kingdom of Jesus, these, these pleasures, these encounters, these, and, I, and I, was, I, mean, I was just coming alive. I did not have good doctrine. I was only a Christian for like this long. So I'm, I'm saying things. I remember I, one of my early prayers was, should we start praying that the devil will get saved? I was praying stuff like that. I'm like, oh man, I feel so bad. The devil's gonna be in hell forever. Forever. Maybe the devil could get converted. And the whole, like that was one of my early, and someone's like, Mike, that's really bad theology. Like I was in these prayer meetings. I was like, Lord, could you just save Satan? Like, would you? And they're like, Mike, you really don't get it. I'm like, well, why not? Like, why couldn't it be? And like in my mind, I'm trying to, and, they, and I would talk to people. And they're like, well, you have to understand to none of the angels. And they would give me like the, the and here was what I found. I, I began having these encounters with God that I just wanted to, I was like, burning for him like all I wanted was was for his kingdom to come and I wanted him like I was hungry for that I was thirsty for that I was enjoying that and then I would meet other Christians that I discovered they had all the doctrine but no experience and I was, I mean, I would even come to church. And I'd be like, oh my God, Father, I adore you. Like we sang that song today. Like that was one of the songs that we sang when I became a Christian. I adore you. Like this is beyond love. It's like, Father, I adore. And I would watch people on their, like imagine a, a husband saying to his wife, woman, I adore you. And I get it. There's some of you that are stoic and that is how you emote. But, but then you're watching them like they're watching Gator baseball or they're watching Gator football. They're watching their kids travel soccer game and, and, and they're like, ah, like, I mean, they, they clearly adore their children. They adore their wife, but they just sort of tolerate God. And I was like, oh man, 
And, and I remember, even though I, didn't, I did not have the theology yet, like I didn't have, but what I had was, I had an encounter with God that was growing. And listen, I am not advocating, like I started reading the Bible, and as I did, I was like, oh man, I prayed some stupid prayers. But at least I had a good heart. I would go up to people, I mean, I would try to tell other, I wanted people to know Jesus so bad, I would tell people about Jesus, and I didn't know the Bible well, so I would just make up, I would lie and make up scriptures. That is not the right thing to do. But, it's like, but I was like, oh man, I want you to know the Lord. And, and I, would, I would make up things. That the, and, and I didn't have the doctrine yet. I didn't have all the character yet. What I had was a passion for Jesus. What I had was in Romans 8, it says that our spirits bear witness with his spirit that we are children of God. Man, there, there is nothing like... When your spirit, when you know it in your knower, there's something, when, when you, it's, it's when your spirit is like, wait, I am a child of God. There is nothing like that. There is nothing on the earth like the experience. I'm not just, the, not just in the head. Our spirits, Romans 8, 16, our spirits bear witness with his spirit. There's something where the spirit of God confirms to the spirit of human. You're a child of God. You're like, what? And, you, and, and you're not just doing the duty. It's a delight. You don't wake up to have a quiet time in the morning because it's your duty. I get it, man. There's times it's a duty, but there's, church, do you still have the delights of seeking the face of God? The delights of being with your Abba, or have you grown old and crusty and cold, or has it never happened to you at all? 1 John 3, 1 says, behold the manner of love the Father has given. Behold, look at it, like, like look at it on all the different sides, like look at, look, look at all, like a diamond that you're looking at all. Behold what manner of love, what manner, what kind of love. The Greek on this, it's a Greek word that it's, it's like saying, from what kingdom, from what country, that'd be like us saying, man, what world is this love from? Behold what, man, do you have that? I'm, I'm not talking theology just in your head. It starts in your head sometimes, but it's got to make its way to your experience where you're like, I'm telling you from experience, what country is this love from? What world is this love from? What experience do you compare this to? What else is like this? Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us that we should be called. Called. Father calls you daughter. Father calls you son. Son. Father, it's an interesting word. In the Old Testament, God is described as father. I think it's 12 to 15 times. God gets described as father about 15 times in the Old Testament. It's very rare, thousands of verses, this many describe him as father. Jesus calls God father 165 times. It was revolutionary. He did not get crucified because he said, go be nice to your enemies. That offended some people. He gets crucified because of his alignment, because he says that God is his father. And he's the firstborn among many brethren where he wants you and me to be able to say, God is my father. Lord, teach us to pray. Pray like this, our I remember being a youth pastor and one of the, one of the teenagers, he, he would not call his dad, dad. He wouldn't call him daddy. He wouldn't call him pop. He wouldn't call him papa. He, he called him Bill. And it broke the father's heart because the, he's like, I just want to be a daddy. There's few things as much of a stab in the back of a father as a child that will not call him. And church, I want to let you know, when we come to God, he is our healer. He is the great, Jesus is the great prophet. He, there are so many titles of God, the sovereign and the judge and the Lord and Adonai and all of these things. But he said, when you pray, pray like this, our Father. 
I, and I, I realize we're so used to it. Like for us, we, we've done it. If you came from a liturgical, if you grew up Catholic or Episcopalian, you, you, if for you, even the, the Our Father is a very formal, it's the opposite of intimate. Do you understand though, when Jesus was teaching us to pray, what it was conjuring up with them was revolutionary intimacy that would blow your mind. Everybody knew God was Adonai. Everybody knew God was Yahweh. Everybody knew God was the Lord, God, sovereign one, judge, maker of heaven and earth. What people did not realize, let me say it to you like God gave a hint to Jeremiah chapter 3. Jeremiah three nineteen says this, how gladly would I treat you like my children and give you pleasant land. I thought you would call me father and not turn away from following me. This is stunning. It's, this is stunning Brene Brown vulnerability of God Almighty in heaven that's, that's showing his vulnerable heart. I am your God, but I want you to call me Father. I want you to call, it's, see, Jesus did not just come simply to bring a legal transaction where he accomplished propitiation or expiation, where he brought about justification, where he took our sins and nailed them to a cross and wiped out a debt. All of these things are gloriously true. But I need you to know that Jesus 165 times reveals God as Father because you and I needed a Savior that could save us from our sins, but we needed shall I say, an older brother that shows us how to come to our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be his name. It's stunning. Hundreds of years have passed in Israel's history and the people still don't get it. They've got the right theology. I need you to understand the Pharisees had the right theology, which is why Jesus would say, do what they tell you to do, but just don't do what they do because they had the right theology. They did not have the right heart. They got the doctrine down pat. And I'm so concerned for Christians in election seasons like this when I watch us fight over the, and we get get the doctrines, and I am not saying let's abandon good doctrine. Man, I will go to the, I I will die on the mountain of right theology, but right theology must include the heart of Abba, Father, or else your theology is always Warped and dead. Hundreds of years have passed. The Israelites still do not get it. And Jesus comes. And a couple chapters in front of this one. I'm going to come back because in, to John 14. But in John 17, Jesus says in verse 17, verse 6, he's praying the great high priestly prayer. He says, I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. I have manifested your name. I have manifested your name. I, I'm purposely using the New King James right now because it says it because of this verse. I've manifested your name. Like sometimes I'm reading the NIV, and the NIV it says, I have revealed you. And it, to manifest someone's name, it, I think it does mean to reveal, but the actual Greek word here is anoma. It's like there, there's a Greek word, it, it's where we get the word name. It's where we get hallowed be your name. It's where we get stuff like you shall call his name Jesus. He says, I have manifested manifested your name. My question is, what was the name that Jesus manifested? To which I've heard people, and this is how I almost always heard it, which was, well, the name of God is Yahweh. True, he had revealed himself to Moses like that. I am who I am. I'm the self-existent one. I, I was, I am, I am to come. He's the God who was and is and is to come. Theologically, there's, there's great revelation in the name Yahweh, in the name Jehovah, in the name Yahweh. It's, it's, a, it's an amazing thing. And yet, what was the name that Jesus manifested? Exactly what did Jesus manifest? And what we find is in this John 17, a half dozen times in this chapter, he reveals the name Father. He called him Abba. In the book of Romans, it says, the spirit is given to us by which we cry out, Abba, Father. 
Every Jew knew the name of Yahweh. They might even say Hashem because they felt like it was so holy that your lips shouldn't even say the name Yahweh. So they were like, well, that's why we'll use other words or we'll say Adonai or we'll just say the name. But, they said, but Jews all knew the name Yahweh. That's not what was being manifested, revealed, and stunning people in a revolutionary way by Jesus. What was stunning them was that he was revealing the name Father. Which is why when you get to Matthew 28, I'm concerned that a lot of, and, and listen, I get it, man. I'm, I'm, I get in these conversations with people that talk about how do you baptize people. Like if you need to get baptized today, we will baptize you in the name of Jesus, the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And Christians even debate over this because in the, in the book of Acts, they baptize them in the name of the Lord. In the book of Matthew, Jesus, he commanded us to baptize people in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. It's singular, so some people say the name of the Father is Jesus, the name of the Holy Spirit is Jesus. So that's why you just, like Jesus only people would say that. But friends, I got to tell you something. People are missing some significant revelation when they, if you get baptized today, just say, you know, I will baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Because there is something powerful when you know the name of God is not just God. It's not, it's not even just Yahweh. There's a reason he's revealed himself like this. And Jesus says, I've revealed. I've, how did Jesus reveal the name of God? He did it as a son, the son, the only begotten son of God, because there is something vital to our constitution as homo sapiens that you and I are wired to need a daddy. We need a father who is in heaven. And a lot of us even in this room, and, and I'm going to spend two weeks on this. This is the, really the, the, the real closing out of the restoration series because we need our father's child relationship restored. Our Father. And there's some of you that are listening to me right now, and you're, there's, so, there's sin areas of your life that, that you're like, I just got a sin problem. No, some of you have a father problem. I, I mean, I, I, you, could cut off, you keep cutting off one branch. You're like, well, well I stopped looking at porn. But if, but if you get rid of one idol and you take up another idol, if you don't get to the root, it never goes away what the real problem was. This, this is why if, if you've got these... If you've got an orphan spirit, see, see, this is really where my, my heart is burdened for us. Jesus isn't just trying to get you to go to heaven when you die. He's trying to bring you to the Father while you live. I, I think a lot of us are like, hey, are you going to heaven when you die? Good question, but here's an even better one. Are you walking with Father while you're alive now? Is this the defining element of your life? That when you fall into sin, do you recognize, oh, wait a minute, I'm not just a scoundrel, I'm living like an orphan. Because orphans, they kind of mess around with the other orphans in the orphanage, because when you got nothing, you might as well go ahead and play the field and scam on some of the other flesh that's in the orphanage. Because if you've got self-control problems with your lust, you're probably living more like an orphan than you are like a child. Orphans, of course you're going to want to go steal from the office or steal from people. Or you're, you're watch, when you're watching someone struggle with the sins that we see in our culture right now, you're watching a culture full of orphans because when you're a son, you know who you are. When you're a daughter, you know what you've got. Because the name has been manifested to you. I mean, you've, you've encountered the name. You're like, whoa, sin like that? Are you kidding me? I've, been, I've experienced father. I'm not an orphan. I know next week, man, if you're a dad in here, just so you know, like you want to be a great dad, next week is where I'm going to really talk about like what does it take to, to know. Like you want to be an amazing father, next week is where I'm going to probably get a lot of that kind of stuff. A lot of us struggle with being sons, which is why we struggle with fathers. But th th this is really where this whole sermon is, where I'm going to end this. When God is your father and you know God is your father and you experience God as father, and you relate to God as father, you stop living like an orphan and you start living like a son. So, so how can that even be? Let me just briefly make it clear from, sort of apply this from, from John 14. How, why is this the case? Well, in verse one, he says, don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe in me. When God is experientially your father, your heart is less troubled. 
You're just less troubled. You, you, you're not as fearful. You're, you're not as confused. You, you don't despair. Like you, You've got a peace. I, I do want to point out the context of this, of this chapter. Like I've been to a lot of... The only time I ever hear verse 1 quoted at church is at funerals. Uh, don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. This is like... A, I've probably heard this 50 times at funerals in my life. I've heard this zero times in a sermon. And yet the context of the verse... It's not like, oh, I'm about to die, so you're so sorrowful. If you back up to chapter 13, it says, verse 36, Simon Peter said, Lord, where are you going? Simon Peter's the guy that kicks us off. Jesus said, where I'm going, you can't follow, but you'll follow me afterwards. Peter said, Lord, why can't I follow you? I'll lay down my life for your sake. And that's when Jesus says, will you lay down your life for me, Peter? Most assuredly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you've denied me three times. The very next word is when he says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Let me make this clear. The context of don't let your hearts be troubled is not, you're so sad because someone died. It is, you're about to fail the biggest failure you've ever failed in your life, Peter. And when you fail, there is a father wound in you that wants so bad to please the boss man to please your dad, to please your mom, to please Peter. You're gonna go. He doesn't even wait for Peter to respond. He says, "But don't let you, you're about to fail me in the biggest way possible. Don't let your heart be troubled." There are some of you listening to me right now that are not even at church. I bet there's someone watching at home online right now. You failed God in some massive way last night, and maybe you tuned in looking for another whipping of like, "Man, you know what I need? I need a pom pom doodle. You know what I need? I need a spanking." No, let, let, you know what you need? You need to hear this. Don't let your heart be troubled. (laughs) You believe in God? Believe also in me. Yeah, yeah, but I'm going to put you on the... Yeah, and Jesus spoke this when he was looking at his his impending, his his coming crucifixion. He said, don't let your hearts be troubled. See, when you let your heart be troubled, you just did what you should not have done. You slept with what you should not have slept with. You went where you should not have gone. You, you fell into, you looked at what you should not. You imbibed and you touched what you shouldn't. And what happens is when your heart gets troubled, you start living like an orphan and you, and you want to avoid, avoid the very answer. And the answer is not to run from father's house. The answer is to run to father's house. Get back to the house. Yeah, but I'm a total failure. What would Jesus say to me? Don't let your heart be troubled. You believe in, God can do anything, but Jesus, yeah, look at me. I went to a cross where I paid for your sins. Yeah, but I feel so bad. When did I pay for your sins? 2,000 years ago. I knew your failure before you even failed. Don't let your hearts be troubled. See, when you know God as Father, your heart is, is less troubled. It's, it's like... When we talk to missionary Sam who comes, I was texting with him this morning, and, and when they rescue children from, from the streets, and they rescue children from slavery, and they put them in these homes where they're getting them ready to be in forever homes, the first thing the kids do is they start hiding food in their pockets because they're not used to having food. They hide it. They're like, no, no, you, we'll give you all the food. And they don't believe them at first. It takes them like sometimes two, three, four, five, six, eight weeks to believe the food's not going to run out. Because when you've been an orphan, you, you got to... You've got a hoard. Some of you that have a hard time giving things away, it's because you have an orphan spirit. If you have a hard time tithing, it's probably a sign that you haven't gotten to Father's house yet, where you're like, wait, no, Father's going to provide. My God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. Someone asks you to share something, you're like, there, there's something new. You say, oh, there's only one piece of pizza left. I better boogie and get to the pizza before anybody else. Like, and so we're like, we're like the kids that missionary Sam brings that, that they rescue. He's like, no, I'm telling you, you're not, like, you're not an orphan anymore. Now you're a child. One of the signs of children, it's, it's like this. When my friend, my friend Brian and I, we were at UF, and he started dating his wife, Monica, and she was the daughter of a surgeon, and they were very, very well off, and so they had several kids, and I remember we took a trip down to Fort Lauderdale one time. We all went bowling. Brian and I did not grow up having a lot of money, and we, in college, did not have any money whatsoever. Basically, we had about this much money right? We're living on scholarships and all the stuff, whatever. So we go down there. We, are, we went bowling with Monica and her siblings. And so we go bowling. I don't know if any of you go bowling or when you do, but what we do is we check how much money we have and we determine exactly how many minutes we can bowl minus the price you have to pay to rent those disgusting shoes, right? So that's how 
That's how we go bowling. So we're going, and we said, well, how, long, how much do we want to bowl? And the kid, all, the, all of them were like, oh, man, don't even sweat it. Like, don't worry about it. We got this. And we're like, um, we, we understand, but no, still, like, how long should we? I'm like, oh, don't even worry. Well, we just kept bowling and bowling and bowling and bowling and bowling. And Brian and I are sweating. We're not enjoying any of this. Like, we're enjoying none of the bowling. I mean, we're, like, trying to go as fast as we can and all this stuff. And we finally get to the end, and all the kids are there. And, and Brian and I are like, you know, gulp. You know, we're, we're, um, so you guys got this? Like, oh, we got it. And then all of a sudden, all of them start feeling their pockets. And they're like, oh, we didn't bring a wallet. And me and Brian are like, we're going to drop out of school for this bowling game right now. Like, that's what we're about to go do because we have no money to pay for this. And we're trying to put all our stuff together. But there was a profound difference between children that grew up in a home where they didn't walk into every room wondering, I wonder if we're going to have enough. Like, Brian and I had a little more, and, and, and some, don't get me wrong, there's some ways in which, like, you know, I grew up in a single parent house, that's okay, I was a college student, that's okay, I believe in good stewardship, I believe in good management, but we got to be honest, a lot of us have money anxieties, not because we're being good stewards, it's because we're orphans. Because when God is your father, and you don't have the, the worry of like, oh my goodness, I, I wonder if... I wonder if dad can handle this. See, what happens when, when you do come to God, when he becomes your father, well, the first thing is your heart gets less troubled. In verse two, he says, though, in my father's house, there's many rooms. The second thing that happens is, you know you have a home. You know you have a home. Home is where you belong. I'm talking to a lot of people in this room right now, or maybe online even right now, and maybe you've kind of like gone from city to city, and you're like, man, I don't feel like I belong yet. Or you, you've gone from group to group, and you're like, I, I feel like I don't belong. Or, or you, you walk into different churches or micro churches, like, well, I don't, I don't feel like I belong. See, watch this, friends. The, the home is not el edificio. It's not the edifice. It's the one that owns the building. What makes home home is Father. What makes heaven heaven, it's not the fact that there's gold streets. It's the fact of who's there. It's that when you look in his eyes and you're going to realize what you always wanted was not like, oh man, if only I could get in with the cool crowd when you're in middle school. Only if I could get like one of the superlatives in high school. Oh, if, if only I could get invited to the, to the rich party when you become a 39-year-old. You know, if only I could get invited to the, to the whatever's when you're 59 years or whatever that is. It's, you're going to get to heaven, you're going to see him face to face, and you're going to realize everything you ever wanted was him. The best marriage was reflecting him. The best parent-child relationship was reflecting him. The best job was reflecting him. The best fellowship was reflecting him. Which is why, if you're like, man, I feel like I don't belong. Listen, when you come to him, you start getting less troubled. You stop looking to your peer group, your husband, your wife, your kids, your earthly parents to provide your home because you realize he is your home. See, see, when you know him as father, it's, it's like one old-time saint. They were about to die, and they told their spouse, I just want you to put on my tombstone, gone home. Gone home. I'm trying to build my dream house. You're, you're never going to find your dream house on this earth. Tr trust me, it's going to rot. You, you just won't. Like, I love the house I live. Like, the house I live, I, I'm so thankful to God for the house I live in. I... I, I, I go outside, I've got a front porch, I've never had a porch, and I have a front porch, I'm like, oh man. I just, but I gotta tell you, there's, there's, a, there's a little ache in every heart that anywhere you go, if you're looking for home and you don't attach it to him, it's never gonna feel right. Which is why people get divorced, because they're looking for that soulmate, not realizing he's the mate you're looking for from your soul. You can change spouses 15 times, it won't do it. You can change neighborhoods, it's not going to do it. The one you're, he says, do you not know, in my father's house are many rooms. When Pastor Lastinger was in his last days, he was probably six months, he was the pastor before me and he was about to die and he had cancer and, and I remember I was at a barbecue restaurant eating with him and at one point I said, hey pastor, what's on your heart? And... This is six months before he died. I remember he just looked down, he looked back up, and 
you know, we're at a barbecue place, and it's weird to have a 75-year-old man start crying, but he did. I said, Pastor, what is it? He said, Mike, I, I just miss him. I miss him. I want to be with the Father. I know I'm with him now at some level, but I, I, I'm longing for him. He had the opposite of fear of death. He, he wasn't trying to die. He was praying for healing. He was going through treatments. He did all this stuff. But there was something in him like, well, you're about to die. It's like, well, death has sort of lost its sting. Because I know my entire life I've been waiting for a room that was mine. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. If, if God, you know, Keith Green said, if, if, if God made the universe in six days and Jesus has been working on your room, your place for 2,000 years, can you imagine what your room is going to be like when you get to heaven? Like, like, have you ever had that feeling if you're married? Like, oh, I, my spouse knows me better than anybody and they still don't know me all the way. You ever had that feeling like, man, my friends, I've got these friends, they know me, but they don't know. Do you understand? You're going to get to heaven, and you're going to be like, you know me. You know me. You see me. You get me. You heard me. You've never forgotten me. The things, little prayers you prayed when you were four years old, and you stopped praying them because you got so afraid of being rejected again. Do you understand? You're going to get to heaven, and you're going to get to your place that Jesus has been preparing since the day that he ascended back to heaven, and you're going to get there, and you're going to be like, this is for me. Church, can we just visualize for a minute the joy that it's going to be when you see the place prepared for you? Who does something like that? A father who adores you. See, number one, your heart's less trouble. Number two, you've got this home. The last thing is when you, when you know him as father, you get an unparalleled unparalleled power in prayer. And that's where he says, most assuredly I say to you, if you believe in me, the works I do, you're going to do too. Whatever you ask in my name, I'm going to do it, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I'm going to do it. You ask me anything in my name, I'm going to do it. Church, I want to call us to pray prayers that act like our Father loves to spoil his children. I want us to pray prayers that reveals the fact to this world that our God is in a good mood and he loves to answer the prayers of his children. I want us to be able to go to our Father and say, Daddy, can I have some French fries? And he might say, you've been eating too many French fries. No. He can say no. He's a good Father. He often says no. The tragedy is, many of us are having our prayers not answered because he's saying no. Our prayers are not answered because we're not offering them. I want us to pray some big prayers. I want us to act like my daughter, Italia, she asks and asks and asks and asks and, and I'll say, no, not this. She's like, okay, well, what about this? I'm like, no, not that either. Well, what about this? She just asks and asks and asks. And she's like, well, you are my daddy. And she knows how to play the card. <laughs> you are my daddy. I am your girl. <laughs> And yet I'm, I'm listening to a lot of us, like, like the Our Father was supposed to, was supposed to like, it's like a, a golf ball being queued up for a drive, and instead it's become like this institutional, like few things have become more institutional than the Our Father prayer. Our Father was supposed to be introducing you. It's like I've told this story before, but I, I love the story of Arnold Palmer going over to, I believe it was Saudi Arabia, and he's talking to the king of, of the country or whatever, and, and, and he's there, and, and he's just this great golf legend, and, and he, he's meeting with the, per, you know, the, the king, and the king's like, you're amazing. What could I give you? He's like, I don't want to ask for anything. I've got everything I need. I'm already rich. He's like, well, well he's like, how about this? Could you give me a golf club? He's like, done. So the next day, he gets a knock at his door. When he opens the door, one of the king's officials comes, and he's got a piece of paper. It's the deed to a club, a golf club, a golf course, to which Arnold Palmer makes the application, which was he, he was expecting a golf club, a $200 golf club, and he got a $200 million golf club. Because when you're in the presence of a king, ask big. And when you're in the presence of your father, walk right in. Church, I just want to call you today to know God as father, to know him. When you come to God, see, 
When God is your father, you stop asking like an orphan. You stop living like an orphan. You stop sinning like an orphan. You stop lusting like an orphan. You know you've got a home. You know where you belong. You know, even if this guy's prospering more than you are, you know you've got a home. You know he's preparing a place for you. You've got an expectation of a future. You know whose you are. You've got this power that's in prayer. It's like I was reading this week about the dad that he had a young son. He suffered brain trauma in, in, in infancy and in, in, in the birth. And when he did, the dad was just never sure if the son understood anything. And so he had the stunted brain development. And they would speak to him about the ways of God. And the mom and dad would try to disciple him. And they would try to read him the Bible. But he never he didn't show any signs. He never spoke. And so a year went by, he didn't speak. And two years went by, and he didn't speak. And three years went by, he didn't. The kid never spoke. And the dad was you know, so frustrated, but he wanted his child to follow Jesus. And almost four years old, he still couldn't speak. And the parents continued just to talk to him about God and read him the Bible and try to show him the path. And one day, the boy needed correction because he was, he was correctable and all this. And, and, and the dad was very perplexed. He was getting frustrated. He didn't even know if the, dad, if the boy could understand anything. And the kid is, is doing his thing. And, he's like, and, and the dad, just, he just finally lost it. And he loses it, throws something across the room and... In that moment of what felt like failure, his son, four, almost four-year-old son, looks at his father and speaks the very first words he would ever say. Pray, Daddy. Amen. And the dad realizes he, he was listening and he did hear it. And he could take these seeds of the gospel of Jesus and the goodness and the presence of the Father. And I want to say to you, some of you fathers here today, pray, Daddy. When your child won't speak to you, pray, Daddy. When you don't know what's going to happen at the job, pray, Daddy. When you're not sure how things are going to turn out, pray, church, pray, Mama, pray, son, pray, daughter. Because Jesus says you believe in God, believe in me. The only thing that could keep you from the Father is your sin, and I've dealt with your sin on the cross. You know the place. No, we don't know the, we don't know the place. You know the way. No, we don't know the way. Jesus says, no, I am the way. Listen, I believe most of you have got the, the way. Today I pray you're going to get the destination. I, I want you today, even as we close, I want you to call God Abba. I want you to call him Daddy. I want you to call him Papa. I want you to call him Father. I want you to, to call him by the name Father. Oh, that you would call. That's what he longed for in Jeremiah. Oh, I would gladly treat you like children. I thought you would call me Father. And in a moment, I'm going to invite all of us just in one corporate confession to say Abba. It was just the Aramaic. It was the way that Jesus would say, Abba, Father. Romans says we cry out, Abba, Father. And, I, and I, we often do a good job, I think, of saying that when we confess Jesus as Lord, there's salvation, and there is. But I think, and I'm praying today for a deliverance that's gonna come. When we say, Abba, and even as we do, we'll do it in the name of Jesus. We're doing it because of the cross of Jesus. And we do it because of the resurrection of Jesus. Let me just be clear. You can't get to the Father except through Jesus. So I point to Jesus. I look at Jesus. I want to reveal Jesus. But as soon as Jesus gets revealed, he's going to say, look at Abba. Talk to Abba. Call to Abba. Cry to Abba. Pray to Abba. Believe in Abba. Trust in Abba. Receive the love of Abba. And there's some of you that have just been orphaned. You've been orphaned and you've been rejected and you've been hurt and you've been wounded. And the answer for the wounds of a fatherless generation is the love of a father and the power of his son by the might of his Holy Spirit. I hear people say the Trinity does not matter. Oh, the Trinity matters. You need the love of a father in the name of his son and the power of his spirit. In the name of the father and the son and the Holy Spirit, I bless you today. In the name of the father and the son Jesus and the Holy Spirit, I pray deliverance upon you today. In the name of the father and the son and the spirit, don't let your hearts be troubled today.